Hey, it's Greg Stanley with the Collector Car Podcast. I've got a really fun and interesting uh, episode this week. I've got Ken Gross is joining me, and we're going to talk about rolling sculpture, streamlined art deco automobiles and motorcycles that are being featured at the Vero Beach Museum of Art, which is very different that you have these really cool cars at a museum of art. So to kick it off, I'd like for Ken to kind of tell us how did this all come about? How'd you pick the cars? And we're going to cover five of his favorite from the uh, exhibition. So Ken, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, so your audience might like to know that fine cars in a fine art museum is not a new idea. In 1951, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, um, they had an exhibition that they called Eight Automobiles. And it was quite controversial at the time. Some people thought it was fabulous. Other people thought it was, uh, what a car is doing in an art museum. Uh, Arthur Drexler, their curator of architecture, was their car curator because they didn't have anyone to do that. And uh, ultimately, people felt it was a great idea. And two years later, the, um, the Museum of Modern Art had a, a subsequent exhibit they called 10 Automobiles. Uh, <laughs> and over the years, they've had cars from time to time. Um, I've done 14 exhibitions of fine cars in fine art museums. And I've, uh, I've been the, the guest curator for that. And I've assisted on several others. So, and you know that uh, people like Ralph Lauren have had his cars in the Boston Museum of Fine Art. And fundamentally, um, automobiles are, you can, you can consider them kinetic art. Rolling sculpture is what we call it here. Uh, these are automobiles in this exhibition that are largely hand-built or built in very limited numbers uh, they um, they embody with the with the craftsmanship that goes into them. They embody some of the same things that you would have if someone created a, a piece of sculpture or or, or a painting. Uh, many of them were built to order, bespoke, if you will. And so uh, when people see these cars, particularly the way we have them in the museum, uh, and if they're not automobile aficionados but they're art enthusiasts, they start looking at a car in a very different way than they've ever looked at a car before. They see it as a piece of art for the most part, and that's particularly gratifying. Uh, planning for this exhibit started almost five years ago. COVID got in the way a little bit, uh, but it, it does take quite a bit of time to um, reach out to major collectors, convince them that this is a place that they should uh, display their car for the uh, although we only have them on display a little over three months, um, you need to collect them, you need to gather everything up, we need to install them in the museum, then we need to break it all down. So for most collectors, it's almost a five-month commitment to be without their their uh, their car, and uh, we could not have an exhibit like this without the generosity and kindness uh, of these collectors. Uh, so I, I always like to start by thanking thanking them once again. Uh, we have 20 cars and two motorcycles in this exhibition. Uh, the Vero Beach Museum of Art is using all of its galleries uh, to do this. I mean, they have a few paintings on the wall, but fundamentally, we're 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 the show for the next uh, three and a half months, ending on April 30th. And um, uh, I was just corresponding with Brady Roberts, the director, and they opened on the. Um, uh, 28th of January, they've already had 3,500 visitors. Wow. So they are very pleased with the way uh, the way it's going. And, uh, and so am I, because uh, you, you never quite know, although most of these exhibitions I've done, nearly all, have been, if not blockbusters, they've been very popular in the museums where they've appeared, from uh, the Portland Art Museum in Portland, Oregon, to the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, to the uh, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Utah Museum of Fine Art. So we've been all around the, uh, the country with these exhibitions. And uh, they've proven to be exciting, a uh, big draw. And they've brought people in who customarily don't go to the art museum. In many instances, they've stayed to become members. So it's a win-win for everyone. Now, that's really, really great. And what I'd like to know is how did the process start? So this one is about kind of art deco cars, rolling sculptures. Did this whole idea, was it, you know, the Vero, uh, you know, Vero Beach Museum of Art said, hey, this is what we want to focus on. Did you have a car you've been chasing for years? Did you have an idea you presented to them? Five ideas. How did it work out? 
Well, I, I think the answer to that is, uh, as we used to have in college, all of the above. Um, uh, they <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> all of the above, right. Uh, Br Brady Roberts is friends with Brian Ferizzo. Brian is the director of the Portland Art Museum. And I did a an Art Deco exhibition for, um, for Portland. Uh, and, you know, Brian and, and Brady talked, and Brady contacted me and I went down and, and uh, got to got to know him, walked through the museum and he said, could we do something like that here? And I said, we could, but I'd like to change some of the cars. There are some cars I've wanted to get in an exhibition like this for a long time and we have the time to, uh, uh, to try to get them and, uh, and that's what I'd like to do. So I, in museum parlance, when you talk about the elements of an exhibition, you assemble what they call a checklist. It's basically an illustrated list of the objects that you're going to feature. So I put together an illustrated plan in a, as a PowerPoint and showed it to, to Brady with a few alternatives. Uh, but these were the cars I wanted, and I said, if I can get these, uh, then this is this will be the exhibition. And he said, go for it. So uh, I began calling some of the lenders that I knew, and in a few instances had to call some people I'd not dealt with before to get cars and as it turned out, at all, we, we got everything we we um, uh, we wanted. Well, so I do have a couple questions at the end of this because I do want to know, you know, what was the hardest car to get? What's your favorite car? You know, some of those general questions. But uh, before we go on, let's talk about some of the cars. Why don't you kind of review uh, some of your favorites? Now, if you're not watching on YouTube and you're listening to this audio only, you got to hear Ken's wonderful voice. But go to YouTube. You'll see some of the videos I took while I walked through the uh, it, through the museum a couple weeks ago. Uh, but yeah, Ken, why don't you talk about maybe your five favorite cars that are in this exhibit and some of the fun facts, you know, um, I know there's some fun stories around how these cars were acquired or some of the stuff, uh, as far as the history of the cars. Well, you know, when you ask someone about their favorite, uh, it's, it's Jay Leno likes to joke. Uh, people say, uh, GJ, what's your favorite car? And Jay always says, well, w which of your children is your favorite? And it, it's, uh, it, but I do have some favorites in this uh, exhibition, not to slight any of our collectors. Uh, one of them would be the uh, 1937 Delahaye 135 MS. And this car is, it's so beautiful, we put it in a gallery by itself. Um, it belongs to the Revs Institute, Miles Collier, and his wonderful museum in Naples, Florida. And it's, Delahaye built, uh, we think, 11 of these. Um, they, in other words, they actually they supplied a chassis, mostly to um, Figoni and Filoski, who were Parisian coach builders in the 1930s, and actually continued for a few years after World War II. Um, Figoni and, Fil and Filoski are derisively called phony and flashy, and I think that's really a disservice because their cars are curvaceous. They use they, they literally sculpt uh, metal, in, and the, the, the cars were these cars were all built by hand. Um, French coach builders used a different technique to bend and roll aluminum than the British did. The British used a device called an English wheel. It's a small wheel of hardened steel, uh, and, and a man, a very skilled operator, can take a flat aluminum panel. Using this, this wheel, he can bend and form uh, the panel. The French did it differently. The French uh, used a machine called Three Olives, and uh, it's essentially mo mo three motorized wheels uh, in, an, in a an assembly that looks like a big lathe. Uh, right. The rollers roll, and two men, one on each side, take a panel and they form it and bend it. Now, in the case of this Delahaye, um, there was uh, very likely a wooden body buck, um, a wooden form in this in this in the shape of this beautiful roadster. And the um, the ateliers the, who were working on this car would form metal and then they would bring it over and lay it on the buck and make sure that it fit. Uh, this is a back and forth process that took quite a bit of time. It also means that um, depending on how the, the buck was built, uh, no, the, the, car, the two sides of the car aren't, aren't exactly the same because right. it's, it's all done by hand. It's not, it wasn't done by a computer or, or what have you. But the end result took about, to just build the aluminum body alone, took about 2,100 hours, man hours, to do. Uh, and prior to that process, um, if you wanted a car like this and you could afford one, uh, you would go to Figoni, you would look at sketches 
uh, you could order this car with open front wheels. You could order it with, with uh, enclosed wheels. You could have hidden headlights in the grill, or you could have raised headlights on the fenders. Uh, you, you had your choice of three different windscreens. The windscreen on this car uh, was a patented device by Fagoni, so it'll roll up and down, which is really uh, makes the car look very racy. Uh, and um, and it's, again, it's just part of the cleverness that went into these cars. Uh, the chassis in, in the car that we have in the exhibit was displayed on Delahaye's stand at the 1937 Paris Auto Show, and the, the body was built the following uh, the following year. Uh, the the leather interior is by Hermes, and it's the original leather. The car has been repainted um, a, a number of years ago. It uh, originally was kind of a white, off-white, ivory color. Now it's more of a metallic bronze. It, it looks beautiful in in any any case. But um, the original owner had a great deal of. He, he was an ambassador to the uh, the French government, and uh, he did not drive the car very much. It's, in total, this car has fewer than than six thousand miles in all oh in, since nineteen thirty seven. Um, right. and, uh, and of course now it's uh, it's restored. It's been to the Pebble Beach Concourse. It's, uh, I've used it in a couple of exhibitions. It's one of these cars that just takes your breath away when you when you see it. I, I refer to it as a Paris gown on wheels, and that's really what it what it looks like. Cars like this were um, were displayed. Owners love to take them to Concours d'Elegance uh, events. Uh, really a beauty pageant for automobiles, but at the same time in France in the 30s and Italy at the same time, uh, these Concours events attracted, uh, in many instances, the couturiers of that era. So a, a, a Coco Chanel or Jean Lanvin would design uh, an ensemble for the lady owner of this car or the, or the lady who was the partner of the man who owned it, and the cars would be displayed, the lady would be costumed up. We have pictures of this in the in our catalog um, and an award or awards were given to the most beautiful ensemble with them coordinated with the most beautiful car uh, to some degree today with uh, Pebble Beach and Amelia Island and many of these Concours events the spirit of that uh, uh, parade of elegance still uh, still continues but uh, events don't work with couturiers to, to dev design special fashions the way they did back in the 30s. Um, the Meadowbrook show years ago in Detroit used to do that uh, in conjunction with the Somerset Mall and some of the, the high-end shops. But uh, I personally, I feel that it, that's a, a lost art and wish that they did it today. But in the meantime, you can see a car like this, Delahaye. But what's Particularly interesting about it, I think, is that under this beautiful, voluptuous body is essentially a racing sports chassis. It has a three and a half uh, liter, three carburetor, 160 horsepower, uh, inline six. Uh, so there's some muscle there. And uh, uh, although the, the wheels, front wheels don't turn too much because the <laughs> fronts are enclosed, um, you could drive this car in a fairly spirited fashion, and people did. It's funny you say that about turning because that was one of the questions I was asked while I was at the exhibit. Like, how can you turn in this thing? I said, well, I think it, it turns until, you know, it can't go any further. Uh, two other well, there are, stops. Uh, there are steering stops. There are steering stops to keep the wheels from rubbing on the fenders. But And some versions of this car didn't have enclosed front fenders. But, again, uh, the whole purpose of this car was not to have anything to do with um, safety regulations. Emissions were unheard of. Uh, this car just had to be beautiful, and that's what it is. I noticed it had like the most complex front fenders I've ever seen in my life, as far as the curvature. You know, like you said, uh, I imagine it probably took like a thirty-two point turn to get it into the into the showroom there. Uh, what is the F on the back of the car? Is that is that the coach builder? Uh, the letter the F. F on no, um, European. They they up until uh, I want to say the fifties or sixties. Because people would be driving from Belgium to France to Holland, whatever, uh, typically they would have that plate which tells the country. So F is for France, oh, okay. um, ES, ES is for Spain, España, um, D is from Ger is for Germany, Deutschland, GB is for Britain, you know, Great Britain. So in addition to the Lexus plate, many cars had that uh, country I identifier. 
because a lot of plates looked alike. And if, if you were driving this car in Germany, somebody more, the, the authorities might like to know, oh, yes, before we try to look up this thing, it's, oh, that's, a, that's from France, that car. Right, right. Coincidentally, okay. Pagoni is, is with an F, but, uh, but right. no, it, it has to do with the, uh, the country of origin. All right, answering questions here. All right, so what's uh, what's the next car on your list for this exhibit here? Uh, well, so we'll stick and stick with France for a few minutes, and it would be the Talbo Lago that we uh, that we have. Uh, and this is another car that this is also by Figoni. Uh, they built twelve of these uh, coupes, fastback coupes, and they built four in a style they call Jean Cart um, with a notchback. This particular car is the New York Auto Show car, so it's known as the New York style. Uh, it belongs to uh, J. Willard Marriott of the Marriott Hotel chain, the chairman, uh, who was a great collector and a, and a good friend of, of the museums, and he, um, uh, he had it restored by David Cart in, um, in Virginia. Uh, it, it, too, has a racing chassis. In this case, it's a four-liter engine, three carburetors, uh, and the cars like uh, like this were actually raced at Le Mans. A, a similar uh, Talbo Lago finished third in the GT class at Le Mans in the 1930s, and others did reasonably well. Uh, this car does not have the enclosed front fender, so you can you can in fact steer it. Um, and the body, once again, uh, you could go to Figoni and specify hidden headlights or enclosed front fenders or you know, any number of little touches that made it special for you, including the color, the interior, the fabric, the leather, and, uh, and, and so forth. Um, uh, the Talbot Lago um, was, uh, Anthony Lago had a great sense of what his wealthy clientele wanted. And while they made some somewhat prosaic road cars, even sedans, uh, the top of the line would be a uh, teardrop-shaped coupe like this. They thought that the teardrop was really the ideal uh, shape for, to the degree that they knew anything about aerodynamics, the, uh, the teardrop was considered the most aerodynamic uh, shape, and this car is just, it's all teardrop. The, the, um, the shape of the roof line, the cutout of the windows, the way the fenders go, I mean, you can just see teardrop repeated over and over again, and it makes for just a beautiful presentation. Now, how many of these did they build? I know it's just a handful, 12, right? 12, uh, 12 in this fastback style and four in the notchback style. So, okay. again, these are very, very exclusive cars. They sell for millions of dollars, uh, and most of them have survived, luckily, and they were, I like to think they were just too beautiful to scrap, you know, even when they became out of date in terms of their uh, uh, mechanics. Thank goodness. Sure. Sure. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, what's next? What's the number three car? <laughs> um, for me, it would be the the Phantom Corsair, uh, yeah. and this uh, this is a car that uh, it was built in 1937, 38. Um, it comes from the National Automotive Museum in uh, in Reno, Nevada, and uh, it's a car that I I've wanted to have in exhibitions for a number of years. But uh, Jackie Frady, who was a, a good friend, the former director of the museum, used to say, it's really one of our star cars. We can't let it go. We can't let it, uh, we can let it go to a show, but we can't let it out for four months or whatever. People come here to see this car. Uh, right. And it, of course, came from the original Harrah collection. Um, but uh, there was a change of directors. Phil McDougall is the new director. And I went to visit Phil in Reno and took him to lunch and said, you know, what, what, what will it take here? I think this, we, this car, pe more people should see this car. We'd love to have it, and we'll, we'll celebrate it if we do. And he um, gave his permission to, for us to have it. It's got a fascinating story. Um, it was the brainchild of a young man, 25 years old. His name was Rust Hines, and he was the heir to the Hines ketchup and pickle empire, if you will. But right. he didn't want to sell ketchup and pickles. He wanted to be a car designer, and uh, he literally he left Yale where he was studying, and he went to um, to stay with an aunt in Pasadena, California, and uh, he had attended classes at the Art Center School. He built models. He built a little streamlined truck, uh, and ultimately he presented the concept for this car uh, on a cord chassis, the, the, the most um, uh, technically advanced 1930s automobile was the Cord, built in Indiana. It, it had a, a 
like them in the aircraft company built, built V8. It had front wheel drive. It had a four speed pre selector gearbox. Um, it, it was totally state of the art, and that's the chassis he wanted for his dream car. Uh, the body itself was built by Bowman and Schwartz in, uh, in Pasadena. Um, he was lucky he didn't have to go very far to find one, one of the best coach builders on the, uh, the West Coast, uh, Maurice Schwartz and Christian Bowman. And the body is, is so unusual. It's really like an envelope. There's no definition on the sides. There's a little in the front where you've got these raised headlights. But conceptually, this car looked like nothing else on the road. It's wider than a cord. The body body is several inches wider on each side. So four people can sit abreast in this car if they're like 1938 wow. uh, small people. And uh, sadly, uh, before... Rest Hines could actually market this car. He wanted to sell it for $10,700, which was yeah. almost an impossible yeah. sum in those days, four times the price of a cord, actually almost five times. But he was out with some friends uh, celebrating, and uh, one of the people, I think the driver of the of the car, they were in an open Fiat, and the driver's hat blew off. They turned around to go back and retrieve the hat, and they were broadsided, and sadly he was killed. So after he died, uh, the car appeared in a um, in a movie called The Young at Heart. Oh. Uh, the movie people named it The Flying Wombat. And okay. I always say to people, you know, you can go on YouTube and there's a clip of The Flying Wombat driving in, uh, uh, in England with people in it talking about what a great car it is and so forth. Then it went to uh, su uh, subsequently a couple of different owners. Herb Schreiner got it uh, at one point. He had Albrecht Goertz read his and uh, I don't think very successfully, as brilliant as Gertz was, Gertz did the BMW 507, um, but subsequently it went to the Hara collection where it was restored many years ago, repainted in its original black. Uh, it's an, the car is not, um, it's not a perfect uh, restoration now. The paint is checked in a few places, but it's a great 10-footer when you stand back uh, the shape just overwhelms you. And when you sit in it, which I've done, um, it's hard to see out of it. There are no mirrors or anything. Uh, it, it really made a statement, and I'm sure it would have been refined a little bit if Russ Hines had lived. But in the meantime, he, he's left us with this almost impossible 1930s car, and uh, I'm just thrilled to have it in this exhibition. Yeah, that car, the first time I saw it, I thought two things would be is the Batmobile from 1937, you know, back when Batman was what, driving right. around. That is just, if for my audio only folks, it is amazing what this thing looks like. And then I also thought about the headlights. That must have been a lot of work to uh, incorporate those into the body, right? Well, you had uh, Bowman and Schwartz, um, you know, they did some fabulous cars, including a Duesenberg for Clark Gable. Um, there really wasn't anything in metal they couldn't, they couldn't do. I mean, people, uh, and I'm one of them, love the work of the French coach builders like Figoni and um, Luchor and Marchand and, and others, but really there were people in America who, who could do fabulous work as well. The style was different. You know, you look at some of the American coach built cars, they're a lot more upright and, uh, and linear as opposed to being curvaceous, voluptuous, the way the French did. And part of that might be that the French, the French had that wonderful three olives machine and you could, you could really work magic with aluminum. And they did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that thing's really cool. So uh, when you're on my podcast previously, we talked about the Hera collection, and you mentioned that he would restore his cars to like one of three levels, bronze, silver, gold. I don't remember exactly. Is, are those the levels? And if so, what level was this one restored to at the time? No, I honestly don't know. I'm thinking that it was probably done to a fairly high level, but it was done a long time ago. And uh, over the years, I don't want to say it's deteriorated, but they haven't... Um, uh, it, it, again, it looks great from a few feet away, but it's not as uh, perfectly restored as, let's say, that Talbot Lago, which is a 100-point car by anybody. Sure. Yeah, okay. All right, we got two more to go. What's next on your list of ones well, that folks really need to be aware of? Mercedes-Benz uh, 540K uh, road, special roadster. I, I think that uh, single thing which was Mercedes-Benz's in-house coach builder, they may have built 18 of these, uh, but again, uh, if you can afford a car like, like this, uh, you can afford to have it any way you want it. So there are some with, with dip doors like a British sports car. There are some with a totally curved line that runs 
from the windshield all the way to the tail. There's uh, concealed spares, open spares. Um, the fender line is different. Uh, they're, they're all beautiful. And the 540K chassis, um, the, the people who bought these cars were often Nazi bigwigs like the Crook family and Herman Goering. Uh, but Jack Warner, the head of Warner Brothers, had a had a special roadster. So it really had to do with, I guess, fame and fame and fortune. Uh, the car we have was built for a young man uh, named Henning von Kruger, and he wanted a sports car. He wanted a, a BMW 328 that he could race. So his sister uh, Gisela received the car, uh, and. Um, she was 21 years old, uh, one of the most beautiful women in Europe. We have a, a photograph of her in the catalog, and she was really stunning. Uh, but uh, 1938, 39, Germany's going to war. The um, uh, everybody who could be commissioned for the military is being commissioned, and the von Kruger family did not agree with Herr Hitler and his ideas, so they escaped to France um, and um, took the car with them. Uh, and when France fell in 1940, they booked passage on the Queen Mary and came to America. Uh, and uh, Gisela stored the car at an inn in Greenwich, Connecticut, and it, it stayed there until she died um, many years later after the war. She went back to Europe. Uh, she, by that time, the family fortune was running out, unfortunately. But she managed to keep her car her whole life and her jewelry, and she lived in a small apartment in uh, I think in Zurich. Um, after she died, the car was sold to pay the storage bills, and it went through um, a series of owners. It was completely restored. Uh, when Chris Charlton, the restorer, uh, was beginning work on the car, they opened the ashtray and found some of her cigarette butts with lipstick uh, on them and her white gloves under the seat. And, uh, wow. So her spirit kind of pervades this, um, this beautiful car. Uh, one of the things about that car that's fascinating, when you l look into it, it's got a creamy, buttery leather interior, and the dashboard has some leather on it as well. And in the corner is a, uh, a shortwave radio, and the station dial lists uh, Munich, Hamburg, Paris. Oh, that's cool. Copenhagen. So uh, the radio itself is bigger, and it's under, under the cowl. But uh, you could drive along in that car and listen to uh, stations all over, all over Europe. It's, wow, uh, it's that's amazing. And any 540K Mercedes is just, you know, well, in, you know, in, in and of thing, itself. I've, I've driven several of them, and they have um, the difference between, say, a 1937 Tobolago or Delahaye and a 1937 Mercedes-Benz. The architecture styles are, are just chalk and cheese. The, uh, the French cars are curvaceous. The German cars are more Baroque. You know, they have a, a brutalist kind of look to them. The, the, the fenders, the lines are, um, they, they seem to say, get out of my way. You know, the, the, uh, the Mercedes has these long uh, horns that stick out in the front. It has a supercharged engine. And uh, Mercedes did its superchargers a little bit different than others. The supercharger is driven off the crankshaft in front of the engine, and it blows through the carburetors instead of uh, the carburetor is doing the mixture and then sucking it in the engine with the blower. So um, there's a detent on the throttle when you drive that car. You uh, step on it and up to a point, and then you step through it. You feel the detent. That engages the supercharger uh, mechanically, and there's a wild scream uh, from the supercharger that you, you don't get with a conventional supercharger. You get a whine, but you don't get this banshee-like shriek. And Mercedes wanted people to use the supercharger <clears throat> only for passing and, and so forth. So they, they suggest no longer than 30 seconds at a time, which would be enough time to sweep around somebody on, on, the, uh, on the Autobahn. But uh, it's just very different, the elements of that, uh, of that car. It comes from <clears throat> Dr. Richard Workman, the Windermere Collection near um, Orlando. And yep. uh, it's just, a, it's, again... Generous collectors are what make this show go around. Right, right. Well, for uh, for my listeners, there's a lot of other cool cars that we're not even going to touch on here. I will put some of the, the Rolls Royce, though. I think, right? Uh, yeah, we do want to do the Rolls Royce. So there's a lot more here. I'll post them on Instagram. So be sure to check that out. And now for the last one, uh, it is my favorite car. Uh, so if you would tell us about the Rolls Royce. 
The uh, chassis was originally built in 1925, and it was going to be bodied by Hooper in the UK. It was ordered by uh, a Mrs. Dodge, whose husband was one of the two Dodge brothers. They had a ton of money, but she never took delivery of this car. Uh, it was bodied by Hooper. It was owned uh, by a wealthy Indian Maharaja for a while, and uh, ultimately it found its way back to Europe uh, to a a coach builder in Belgium called Jean Kier, and uh, they built an entirely new, modern, uh, very, um, for Rolls Royce anyway, very aerodynamic body. The big Rolls Royce grille is slanted uh, rearward, and uh, the car just uh, seems to be one continuous curve from the windshield all the way to the long extended tail. Uh, the doors are a complete round circle. They're almost four feet wide, and uh, the windows, because you really can't drop a window in a round door. The windows fold like the blades of a fan. Uh, the car has, um, right now, it's it, it, now it's finished in black. It has a almost like a dorsal fin <coughs> on it. Uh, it, the, it. It's just outrageous. It's big. It weighs um, three and almost three and a half tons. And um, when it was restored, and they left the bumpers off, which is probably just as well, because we never would have fit it in the museum. We measure everything to get these cars in. But I used to, I woke up a few nights before the installation where I, I thought, oh, my God, what if we can't get that car in? And it's sitting there on the loading dock. Um, I think we can do it. Uh, but I really was uh, I really was concerned. And when I got to the museum, I, I became even more concerned because it looked to me as though the museum had shrunk since I'd visited the last time. But uh, with a skilled crew, um, I work with um, a fellow named Webb Fair, who was the manager of Peter Mullen's collection in Oxnard, California, uh, in the past. Um, a guy who could literally put a car through through the eye of a needle. And Jeff Orwig uh, from the Bear Collection up in Maine. Um, between the two of them and the help from the preparators and John Golombowski from the Lyle, I sound like one of those indie, indie guys taking his hats off and thanking sponsors, but you just can't do an exhibit like this without these skilled uh, uh, colleagues. And, uh, and we, we were able to fit the cars in. Now, you asked about the installation. This museum is kind of long and narrow. So what we had to do is put the cars in exactly the way they would be in the gallery. So first in, last out, uh, which meant that we had to coordinate, and John did this, the trucks there at the right time so that everything could um, uh, could be done exactly the way it had to had to be. We couldn't put, put a, a late car in. Everything had to be there on time and had to go in a, in a certain way, and, and it did. You know, we were able to do it all in a little, about two and a half days. So uh, it, 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 it's an exciting process, and uh, I, I just am thrilled to be a part of it. Yeah, and two things about that Rolls Royce that caught me is first off, if there ever was an Art Deco locomotive looking car, that's it. That thing is just insane. And then I'm not a guy that likes black cars typically. I think that's the perfect color for that car. But if it wasn't black, is there a color you think would be perfect for that car? Yeah, well, it was gold at one point in its life yeah. with with a metal flake. It was white as near as we can tell from old black and white um uh photography i think it would look very nice in like a dove gray myself because mm -hmm. you can see some of the details but it is sinister and black and uh black is black is what it is so yeah yeah it's very well, cool. that changes. yeah so i appreciate you joining the collected car podcast now the exhibit goes through april the 30th is that correct yes and on march 1st uh we're doing hoods up so i'll be opening doors and raising hoods on most of these cars so people can see the engines. Uh, typically in a museum, it's a static display. You know, we don't start anything uh, and you can't really look inside them. But on that one night, March 1st, we're going to have a special uh, presentation and uh, I encourage people to come and see the exhibit anyway. But if you happen to be in Vero Beach uh, on March 1st, you'll get an extra special view of engines and interiors. Yeah, so if you want more information, just go to the description on YouTube or on the podcast, and all of the links will be will be there uh, for easy access. So, Ken, thank you so much for being on the Collector Car Podcast yet again. Thank, thank you, Greg. It's, uh, nice to talk to you, and uh, I hope everyone comes to see the exhibit and buys the catalog. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I appreciate that.